<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. You've made it to concert day. Congratulations. Oh, I'm so excited to hear you all sing and play tonight. I've been waiting for it all week. It's going to be great. So pumped. Um, let's jump right in. Remember, our theme this week is whatever is true, based, based on Philippians 4, 8 and 9, not 16 to 17, as I accidentally said earlier. But before we begin, we must start with our pun of the day. If you know the answer, can you raise your hand? Why can't a skeleton play in church? Annika? Oh, good guess. You're on the right track. Daniel? Because he doesn't have any organs. Because he doesn't have any organs. There's no organs in the skeleton. Yeah, nice job. Cool. Nice work. Oh, coming at you. The skibbity candy. Here it is. And Annika, thank you for trying. You were close. All right. Next. Oh, interruption from yesterday. Do you remember the title? Say it with me. Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. Hey, let's say it again. Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. So that was yesterday. We really only talked about what to do, and we talked about how to do it. But today, you received a handout on your way in. Today, we're actually going to do it. Too often do I feel uh, ill-equipped leaving Sunday morning at a church. I'm like, thank you so much for that sermon. That's great. You told me how to do it, but I have yet to do it, and I still have to sort out a lot of kinks in the system. I want to sort those out with you today so you, you have a successful experience studying God's Word. So when you go home, you have no excuse. <laughs> you can say, oh, I've already done this. I know how to do this. I'm brand new at it, but I, I at least did it once with Caleb. So that's what we're doing today. Our week outline, quick review again. We had Jesus' resurrection on Monday. He actually rose from the dead. Pretty crazy. It's life-changing. Two, the Bible's legit. It was actually written by God. It's the most reliable text in all Scripture. Implications. On Wednesday, we talked about our public performance identity. How do we view ourselves in relationship to God, more importantly than our relationships with one another? We are all sinners in need of grace. Fourthly, that was yesterday. How do we practice music well? Apply the same concepts to how do you practice reading the scriptures and studying those really well. And today, we're going to do it. All right, we are saying these together for sake of time. Can you say it with me? The scientific method can only be used to prove something that is. Observable and The legal historical method has three pieces of evidence. Say them with me. Oral testimony, written testimony, exhibits and artifacts. Name one piece of evidence. Well, we're going to name them all. Here we go. Thanks for raising your hand. Here we go. 500 eyewitnesses transformation of the disciples, the written Gospels, and New Testament. Good. Next. What are th the three tests of historicity for the Bible? Let's say them together. The bibliographical test, internal evidence, external evidence. Next. Jesus fulfilled how many? Say it. 60 major prophecies, right? And 270 ramifications, meaning smaller connections that are not obviously like Jesus fulfilled this, was like connected to him, kind of like a second hand thing. Each New Testament book was originally written only how many years after Jesus' death? Good, 50. How many earliest manuscripts do we have today? Good. Belittling others and self deprecation are both forms of pride. pride. And the solution to those is to get our minds off of ourselves. They're both self-absorbed, selfish roots where we are obsessed with ourselves. But if we can view ourselves in perspective to our Lord and Savior, we have no option but to view, to look outside of ourselves, to bless others in the way that God has blessed us. He has blessed us so much by His Son, we must seek to encourage and bless others as well. It's the only recipe to defeat these kinds of sins, right? You have to get your mind off yourself. What examples of humility must we intentionally use to combat pride in our hearts? Oops, I think I just gave some of them away. <laughs> let's, let's read them. Encourage others, pray, memorize, and meditate on applicable scripture. 
And that's something you can look up on Google. Like, if you're having a tough time with a specific head game, it doesn't have to be with pride, it can be anything else. Look up, hey, Bible verses on this section. Check out the verse and read the context, too, to make sure it's actually saying what it's supposed to be. Really good. Name this, oh, seven methods of meditation, not just six. Let's do it. Ready? Rewrite the text in your own words. Illustrate the text. Pray through the text. Inductive study. Gospel connection. Memorize the text. And seven, Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Great. And that's just saying what is true about the text. Today, we're going to try, for the first part of our time together, to just apply my two favorites, inductive study, and three, praying through the text after doing inductive study. Then, after that, you notice there's two passages on your handout there. The second passage is for you to choose whatever method you want to and apply it to that passage, or you can just revisit the first passage and do a new method that we haven't tried today. So... Buckle up. Let's jump in. Oh, look, I even made a slide. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts as we study and meditate on your word, may those meditations and thoughts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, teach us from your word. We want to learn from you. Increase our desire for you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's read our theme verse. Say it with me. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Good. In other words, you think about what's true, then you put it into practice, and finally, day five... Poof! We're putting into practice. We're applying everything we've learned this week. How do we pursue the Lord? Let's do it. Let's read His Word. That's what He tells us to do. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to God's Word. Straight out of Psalm 119. Let's do it together. Today's theme, practice, practice, practice. Let's apply what we learned yesterday. And you know, how do you, get, how do you equip yourself for an excellent performance in music? You must practice well and a lot. And the same would happen in our relationship with God. How do we improve, how do we improve our relationship with God in our headspace? And how do we mature as Christians? We must pursue the Lord a lot. We'll do it. All right. So you see the first text in your, in your handout is Ephesians 2, 1 through 11. I have two readers for me this morning. They're going to read first, uh, the, the first half, and the second half. We're going to read this a total of four times. Repetition, practice, practice, practice. Reading once isn't going to cut it. So on our first read-through, look out for some key terms. We're doing inductive study. So look out for some words that repeat themselves. And if you note them, you can underline them or make a, a, fancy, a fancy symbol. I'm not even going to underline in my first read-through. I'm just going to read it, think in my mind, Oh, I noticed that repeated. I noticed this repeated. And then on the second read-through, that's when I start to write. But if you really want to write now, you can. All right, Avery's going to start us off, followed by Renee. Go ahead, Avery.
Thank you. Snaps for our readers. That's a long passage. Good job. Well done. Lots of big words. That's your classic tough Pauline chunk where he has a long sentence that doesn't follow English grammar rules. Good job. So as we read through, you may have noticed a few key terms. Did anyone notice some words that repeated? What are some words? Yeah, Abigail. Dead in our trespasses. Yeah, the word dead in general continues to repeat. That's one we're going to talk about. Anyone else notice a repetitive term? Levi? Alive. Say again? Alive. alive. The contrast. I always like to look for the opposites, right? You have dead versus alive. Claire? Christ Jesus. Look, that man's all over the place in this passage. Yeah, it's good, a good idea to mark him up. Yep. Grace? Yes. Great name. My wife's name. It's a good one. Yep, and it's all over the place. What's the opposite of grace in this passage? Can you think about it? Grace is something not earned. Yes. Oh, great. Right on it. What's your name? Selah. That's right on. So we have works versus grace. These are a bunch of words we're going to dive in first with. Oh, wait. Here's some other ones I see. Sin is all over the place. Saved. And there's, there's oftentimes synonyms. Big word means you probably know it. Something else that means the same thing as the word you're looking for. So we're going to look for grace. Mercy is another synonym. Mercy means being, um, wrath is being withheld. Something bad is being withheld. Grace, something good is being given. Both are undeserved. And then we have works. So we're going to um, zoom in on grace and mercy. If you have coloring materials, as I, as I uh, encourage you to bring them, I always love using color to annotate my Bible so that I can see it and pops out more. If you don't, just use your pencil. And I would like to use a special symbol so that I can watch that symbol move through the text. For grace and mercy, I use an arrow because God is giving us something we don't deserve. You don't need to do that, but if you want to use that as an example, you can. Works. Bad works. Naughty works. So I do a little squiggly red line. You do what you want, all right? Let's read through this again. This time, I will read it for you. Every time one of these key terms shows up, I will highlight it on the board for you, and you can copy it down. But you might even beat me to it. Some of you probably already have. Let's read through it. I'll read it out loud right now. Read along in your handout or up here. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Freeze. You can kind of see verses 1 through 3, it's all depressing. We are lost. Sinners. Blah, blah, blah. But you know what's coming next, right? Verse 4, here it comes. But God, being rich in what? Mercy. Mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive with Christ Jesus. By what? By grace you have been saved. Make sure you mark that. Verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in, the kind, in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's a synonym of what? Works. It means the same thing, right? It is the gift of God. Remember, it's a gift is always undeserved. You don't get something as a gift because you earned it. It's always something undeserved. So that is definitely grace. Verse 9. Where am I? Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's weird. It seems to state it in a positive light. Like we're supposed to do works, but it was just poo-pooed? What's that mean? Last part, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I like to underline that too. It's walking in them. What is them referring to? Works, right? You might have found a few other ones in here, but these are the ones I find. We're going to talk about this 
particular one in a minute. I want you, for the next two minutes, this is what I do when I study the Bible, and it's what many people do when they study the Bible. They write these notes down. They take a minute to reflect on them. They use a journal, a separate piece of paper, which is on the back side of your piece of paper, um, and you can, you can write down what you learn about the passage in light of these two terms and the relationship between the two. So take two minutes. I'll put on some, some not, so, not so great piano music. I'm sorry, pianists, who are you in the, in the room? You're probably going to be like, this is the most lame piano music I've ever heard in my life. It's, it's supposed to be simple to not keep our brains super focused on the music, all right? Two minutes. Here we go. Write down what you've learned about these two terms in that passage, and then we'll jump back together. Use that back side of your paper. It's great space for you. I'm going to rudely interrupt you. Keep writing, okay? For anyone who has something that they learned that they'd like to share with the group, I'd love for you to take that moment now, raise your hand and share something that you noticed. Between grace and works, what do you learn about this passage? Yes, tell me your name again. Vivian, what did you learn? We don't earn God's love. That's not something we earn. Coming at you. Yep. Isaac? Oh, that's good. So you're hitting right on that big question. What's up with the good works being painted in a good light? God wants us to act out our salvation through good works. But we're not, we don't have to do good works to earn the salvation. It's just a reaction to it, right? Yeah. right on. It's only, we, the only way we are saved is not by our works, but who worked on our behalf? Who did that? Jesus. Sunday school answer, Jesus did it for you. He did the works for you, right? Right on. We've got to keep moving because we have a couple other terms to look at. Thanks for your input. Let me mention what I learned. Nothing we can ever do, meaning works, cannot earn our salvation, but we're saved to do good works. It's something that happens after we're saved. Specifically, those which, and this it says right down here at the bottom, God prepared these beforehand so that we would walk in them once we're saved. They're just a natural reaction. After you come to know Jesus, by grace alone, not by your own works, you can't help yourself. You have to live for him. It's, a just, it's so amazing that you are saved by him the natural thing to do is to go live for him. Of course you would want to do good works for him. It's what you would want to do. You're a new creation. Let's keep rolling. Our next term. Nope, let's keep rolling. Dead versus alive. This is the one we're going to go for. I like to actually cross out the term dead because we're gone. We're dead. We're gone. Alive. Yay, all the sunshine symbols. Woohoo. Let's read through. This is our third read. We have one more read after this, and then we'll finish up. Read along with me on that front part of your paper and mark the words when they show up. This is in verse 1. Here we go. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, oh, love this verse, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, he made us 
alive together with Christ Jesus. By grace you have been saved. Here's a synonym. And raised us up. Who else rose up? Jesus, on his school answer, right? So we rose up with him, Jesus. And God seated us with him in the heavenly places. Where are we? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. This is a loose connection to a lie. I'm going to mark it. Created. God creates from nothing. Big word, ex nihilo. He created the whole world out of nothing. And he drew you out of the pit of sin that you were in. You were pretty much nothing to God. And he saved you to become something, to put it crudely. You are saved, created now in Christ Jesus, holy in his eyes because of the holiness of Christ. So, in light of these terms, what do you learn from dead versus alive? How do those terms relate to grace and works? Write your thoughts on the back of your paper. We'll take two more minutes. Here we go. What do we learn from these two? Keep writing if you're writing. I don't want to interrupt you. Lucas? Yeah. Let me say that again. You'll be dead in your works if you just try to earn your way there. But you'll be alive if you trust in God's grace and accept the free gift of righteousness through Jesus Christ. That's, ooh, wow. You want to come up here and just give the sermon for us? That's awesome. That's really good. That's really good. Cool. Yes, Hannah. Um, I noticed that whenever it says dead or whatever, it's like Wow. So all we had to offer us while we were dead was our own sin. How awful is that? But when we're made alive, it's it's always accompanied by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. One last piece. Yep. Levi, you want to? Thank you, Lydia. Oh, by far. So much better to be alive in Christ than to be dead and lost in our trespasses, right? Here's what I have to say. Here's my thoughts. Not that they're more important than yours. It's just what I gleaned. Since we were dead in sin, we had no chance of saving ourselves, right? It was a sheer act of grace that God saved us. Now we're a new creation in Christ created for good works. We were dead in our sins. By grace, we were saved. We were made alive and we were created for good works. That's where my mind goes. Fourthly and finally, to close out our time together, we're going to pray through this text. What that looks like. Yep, third method. You pray through the text, so you personalize the pronouns. You change it up so that it makes it like relatable as though you are in the text. You're in the story. What you're not doing, don't misread me here, do not change the meaning of the text to be something other than it is. You're just applying it to your life right now. So here's what I mean. Example, verse 1. And you, you, or you, were dead in the trespasses and sins. How do you make that personal? And I was dead in the trespasses and sins. Do you see what I'm doing? It doesn't really change the meaning. It's just talking about me because it's true about me. Here's what we're going to do. Eyes open. Pray with me silently while I read through what I have rearranged to be the same text, but applied to me personally and you personally. Let's pray it silently together. I'll read it out loud. Lord, I was dead in my sins. I followed everyone else. I was stuck in sin, hopeless and lost. 
but you being rich in mercy because of your great love for me, even when I was dead in my trespasses, you made me alive with Christ. By grace, I have been saved. You raised me up with him and seated me with you in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages you might show your, show your immeasurable grace in kindness toward me in Christ Jesus. For by grace I have been saved through faith, and this is not my own doing. Oh, Lord, it's a gift from you, not a result of works, so I can't boast about anything, not my musical talent. Not my athletic, academic talent. Nothing. I am nothing aside from you, Lord. For I am your workmanship, your masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which you prepared beforehand that I should walk in them. Help me walk in good works and live in light of this immeasurable grace today. Amen. It's this process, the inductive study, praying through the text, meditating on God's Word that suddenly gives us a lot more substance to our time with God. Merely reading it through once, not really looking for any specific details, will leave you high and dry. But when you mull on it and chew on it and look for as many different things that you can get out of it as possible, and then you pray through it and surrender your thoughts to the Lord before you go out to your day, before you go to school, before you go out to Chehi, before you go on to your summer camp that you're doing later this summer. Man, your mind is set on the Lord before the day even begins. <laughs> God's going to bless your day. He's going he's gonna to guide you through that. We've got we to gotta wrap things up. Oh, we don't have time for this. I wish we did. Who likes Lego Batman? Best movie of all time. Probably the stupidest movie of all time, too. <laughs> um, you have your handout. Another time, maybe tomorrow morning when you're home, check out the second, the second passage or apply one of your favorite other tactics of meditation to the first passage. Work alone at home. You've got the tools. It's all right here for you. We don't have time for this. Let's keep rolling. Ah, stupid piano music. <laughs> all right, let's keep rolling. So for those who know the theme verse and recited it. I'm going to have you stand in a moment. You know who you are. You recited it to somebody. Um, you will stand and recite the verse in a moment. In a moment. Okay? Hold up. Hold up, y'all. If, if you didn't recite the verse, I'll have you recite it with us in a moment, but I just want to honor those who took the time to try to memorize it. So if you did memorize it, please stand. Everyone else hang tight. All right, for those who recited the verse at some point between yesterday's chapel and today, let's say it together. Ready? Whatever is, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Very good. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Give it up for our people who recited. Cool. Thank you, thank you. You can have a seat. Thank you very much. For those who recited, you can stay right after chapel in a moment. I'm going to have, I'll, I'll make a brief announcement about this. There's 10 of you who got it done really quick, and I'll give you first dibs on the merch. It's all over here. And then after that, everyone else can come down to, um, if, you, if you recited the verse to come get your stuff. Remember, the, the reward in the long term is not this merch. That's going to that's gonna fade. But God's word, preserved over 2,000 years, is now hidden in your heart. And it's changing you already. You know what's true. You know that Jesus rose from the dead. You know that the Bible's true. You know how you should view yourselves in relationship to others and God. And you know how to study his word. Take these tools with you. Apply them. The last thing I can possibly say for us this week. Oh, hold on. My favorite words from, not Paul, my apologies. This is from Jesus himself. Let's read it together. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, 
and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Whatever is true, when you pursue it and find the Lord, He is the source of all truth. He will set you free from your sin and give you new life in Christ Jesus. We are created in Him for good works. Praise God for His work on the cross. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank You so much for Your Son, the work that He's done on the cross. Thank You for Your Bible that we have in front of us. Would You teach us more and more how to love You and serve You as we study Your Word when we go home? Give us strength today as we have a lot to do to prepare for this concert. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.